Michael. Yes. Let's let's get to the heart of the matter. What prompted you to write this this book? I was looking for my next book. I had just done a blurb uh, for a Vietnam book for an editor of mine uh, at New American Library. And when I sent him the blurb, I just added a note saying, I'm looking for something to write. Implicit in that is I'm looking for something to write that a publisher will buy. Um, there's lots of stuff I can write, but it's not a hobby. Um, and he sent me a note back that said, you know, World War II books are still very marketable. And it took me no more than three minutes, maybe even less. And I sent an email back to him saying, I want to track down the guys who liberated the concentration camps, talk about what they experienced then, and talk about how it's affected their lives. And the reason that was in my head was because about three weeks before that, I had seen a PBS series called The Jewish Americans. And in that was probably a 30, 35 second clip of a retired New York attorney named Alan Moskin, who described liberating a camp called Gunskirchen. And for some reason, it filed away someplace. When you're doing what I do as a freelance person, you're always filing stuff away and hope you know, something will get triggered. Well, it got triggered. He answered and said, that's a great idea. I sent, elaborated a little bit more, sent it to my agent. He said, that's really a great idea. And if anybody out there knows agents, they'll go, gee, that's a remarkable response. Because usually they're going, eh, can I really sell that? Um, it does come down to, you know, crass commercialism. Can I sell that? Which is important because I know I'm going to spend two years of my life on this project. So that's really how it started. The next step was write a proposal. Book proposals that I write generally run from 60 to 80 pages. It's, you know, 20,000 words. Um, I began trying to figure out, okay, how can I track down enough people to just give me the material to outline a book and, and to write a proposal, which includes at least one sample chapter. I ended up going to the reunion of the 42nd Infantry Division in Mobile, Alabama, uh, where I talked to several people. Um, the reunion of the 42nd Division sounds like a big thing. Frankly, they're down to about 35 guys. Mm. Um, I, I, I then started going online, and you'd meet one person, and he says, and you call him on the phone, and he says, well, you need to talk to so-and-so, talk to so-and-so, talk to so-and-so. And you begin to follow that through. Some of those are blind alleys. Sometimes you call, and, and you get to the point where, you know, you get a name, you get a state, you use Zabba search, and you come up with a phone number, and you sit there staring at the phone because the odds are this is not going to be pleasant. And you dial the number, and you get beep, 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 this number is no longer in service, and you know the guy's gone. Or you get, as often happened, a woman answering the phone. Is Jerry Smith there? Who's calling? My name is Michael Hirsch. I'm writing a book about the liberators of the concentration camps. Well, he died four months ago, or he died six months ago. Um, and those are hard conversations to have. I mean, you really do sit there. I do sit there staring at the phone going, okay, am I going to go through this again? And eventually you go through it. Um, you write a proposal. Um, in this case, we had several publishers who were interested and uh, chose to go with the Bantam Dell Division of Random House because uh, the publisher is the daughter of Holocaust survivors. And the book meant something to her. From an author's point of view, you would like the book to mean something to the publisher more than just another item in their catalog because that will show up later on in terms of promotion, publicity, how they treat the book. You mentioned a little bit about calling on the phone mm -hmm. to speak with uh, soldiers who, who liberated uh, the camps. How many soldiers did you reach? Where were they from? Um, when it was all over, I probably talked to over 160, maybe 165 people. They're not all in the book. Some of them had nothing to say. Some of them didn't want to say anything. Um, they're from the soldiers and the nurses, female, are from everywhere in the U.S. I mean, I interviewed as many in person as I could. I had been up to Chicago and I interviewed a bunch of people there in the New York, New Jersey area, 
down here in South Florida. Um, the rest I interviewed, at, at, well, I, I went to the reunion of the 42nd Division. I went to the reunion of the 80th Infantry Division at Carlisle Barracks. I went to the reunion of, I believe, the 69th Division in the D.C. suburbs. Uh, most of them were on the phone. Most of these guys are from all over the United States. There are a few people in the book who were not liberators. They are survivors, and they're in the book um, because of a special relationship they may have developed with one or more of the liberators, or in the case of a woman who uh, actually lives in Israel, uh, she's in the book because of a letter she had written thanking the Americans for, for essentially saving her life. Um, there's also one man, a survivor, Israel Cohn, who lives in Canada. And the reason he's in the book is because the liberation of the Kaufering camps near Landsberg, which is a, a subcamps of Dachau, took a long time. The prisoners thought it was going to happen. They could hear the advancing army. They could hear shells bursting at night, see them against the clouds. And the Germans left, and they thought they were free. The Germans came back. And it was such an incredible story that I needed to have somebody inside the camp talk about, you know, if I had the opportunity to have somebody inside the camp talk about what's going on as we're waiting for the Americans, um, and I found this man. Uh, he had actually written his own book, and, but I found him and was able to talk to him, and it just fit. Otherwise, uh, it's all um, U.S. Army soldiers, and one U.S. Army one U.S. civilian who was uh, 4F, couldn't be drafted, couldn't serve, and wanted to fight. Uh, and he volunteered for the American Field Services, and they drove ambulances throughout the combat zones. And he ended up getting uh, to Bergen-Belsen with the Brits and the Canadians. Other than that, it's all Americans. What most surprised or shocked you as you were speaking to 60 or so, 160 or so, liberators, nurses, few survivors? Um, there's probably a list of things. Uh, first and foremost is, is how so many of them were still affected by what they had seen and been through 65 years ago. Second was probably um, the fact that They'd either told nobody about their experiences in any sort of detail um, or had only done so relatively recently. I mean, if a guy keeps this inside for 50 years and doesn't tell anybody, there's something going on. And, and that surprised me. The third thing that really surprised me, um, in light, and it means something today in light of you know, our concerns about what happened at Abu Ghraib and that sort of thing, was how many of these guys had no qualms telling me that you know the Geneva Conventions were, for all practical purposes, suspended. When they got to a concentration camp, the SS usually had fled just ahead of them. If they caught up with them, they killed them. If the SS were trying to surrender, they killed them. Um, they, they, they told me that there were actually times when orders went out, we're not taking prisoners this week. You know, they were absolutely pissed off at the fact that these people could do that to other people, and they just weren't going to deal with them as prisoners, and they blew them away. There was one man I spoke with who literally found one SS guy as he was changing into civilian clothes, and he had a gun right on the man's chest, and his buddies were saying, kill the bastard, and he couldn't do it. And I asked him why. He said, because I realized that I may be a killer, but I'm not a murderer. Um, but that wasn't the distinction that so many of the guys I talked to made. And for what it's worth, I don't find any fault with what they did. I just don't. Um, when I raised the issue of the Geneva Convention, it was almost, you're kidding me, really? In doing the interviews and in writing the book, what lessons did you take away? What lessons do you want the reader to take away? My biggest concern was that the reader would say, I've heard this story, and there's a phrase that so many of the guys used. 
they talked about bodies stacked like cordwood. And when you initially hear that, it's shocking. When you hear it for the 45th time, it's, and I hate to be crass, but it's, yeah, tell me something different. And as a writer, as a journalist, as a human being, I have to force myself back to say, no, 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 no. This is this man or woman's unique experience as an 18 or 19 or 20-year-old kid suddenly confronted without warning, but a warning wouldn't have helped anyhow, but suddenly confronted with mass murder and mass attempted murder. And if 65 years later they're saying bodies stacked like cordwood, I have to write that. When I, first, when I wrote the first draft of the introduction, I, 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 I talked about Hannah Arendt who wrote a book titled The Banality of Evil and I said, about the Eichmann trial. And I said there's actually a banality of language. You hear this phrase, you know, body stacked like cordwood, and it's like, oh yeah, you know. And I actually begged the reader not to let that happen. I said, you can't do this. You have to read it as though it's another story. My editor, wisely at the time, I didn't realize that, said to me, don't tell a reader how to read your book. Write it the best way you can. You know, put in what you think needs to be put in and trust the reader. Um, overall, in terms of being a writer, that may be the biggest lesson I learned is, is do your best job and trust the reader. If you can get the reader to pick up the book, trust that reader to, to, to get it. So how do you tell the story without falling into the trap of bodies stacked like cordwood? I had to come up with an organizing principle. It, it couldn't be an anthology. Uh, it couldn't be an anthology for a couple of reasons. Um, one of which is publishers will not buy anthologies. If I said I'm going to interview 150 you know, of these guys and each guy will have his own chapter, they would have said, see ya. Okay. If Studs Terkel walked into to a publisher today with a proposal for working, they'd say, yeah, it's a nice idea, not for us. It wouldn't sell. That's not to say it really wouldn't sell, but they believe it wouldn't sell. Um, so it was a matter of figuring out, well, what's the organizing principle here? What makes it different? There have been a couple of, of academic type books that have some collections of interviews with liberators. And those of you who are in the academic community will pardon me, but they're not necessarily the most easily readable things you can find. Um, the organizing principle here had to be the timeline. Um, what I discovered that in negotiations between the U.S. Army Center of Military History and the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, the Army had come up with a timeline that showed what division they were crediting with, and I make that really clear, they were crediting with, liberating what camp on what day. So the first camp, Ordruf, was liberated on April 4th, 1945, and the last camps were liberated May 7th, May 8th. VE Day was May 8th, 1945. So I had this organizing principle. It's sort of like a spine. And, and I, I knew what divisions were at each of these places. Then it became a matter of trying to track down someone, more than someone, at, at each of those places, or as many of those places. And then I discovered there were holes in there that I'd fill in. I mean, there was, there's, a, there's a chapter in the book, uh, chapter 9, Gardelagen, uh, where even the good Germans had blood on their hands. Um, I was talking with somebody about a, a veteran, and he said, do you know about Gardelagen? And I said, no. He said, look up Gardelagen. And I looked up Gardelagen, and I was horrified. And, and then it became a quest, okay, now I need to find somebody who had been at Gardelagen. And I found a name on the web. I should say, without the web, there's no book. This book, it, this book timeline from February of 2008, when I wrote the proposal, we sold the book around April. I finished the first draft in April of 2009. It's now almost April of 2010. Um, that's the timeline for, for doing this. Um, so I, I, I find, 
you know, it, it, it's trying to find somebody for Gardelagan. And I come across a name. And he's from Ohio. And I do a search, and I come across a phone number. And I call him. And, and his entire interview is in the book. It takes about one sentence. I said, this is Michael Hirsch. I'm doing this or this. Uh, were you at Gardelagan? He said, I've spent my entire life trying to forget it. That was the interview. That also was what made me say, I've got to look for more. Um, and that's, pro uh, of all the things in the book, that's probably the one that's had the most negative, lasting effect on me. Because it was ordinary citizens involved in killing 1,016 political prisoners in one place at one time, not to mention the other 900 that they killed between on the death march from where the train stopped till they got to Gardelagan. But it was civilians doing this with an American Army division less than a day away. And, and I have a hard time getting that out of my system and going, what kind of people could do that? And, and those people, um, you know, they're, they're, a lot of them are probably still alive today. Certainly their children and their grandchildren are alive. Um, I know this year that some of the guys who, who, who got to that place have been invited back there and there's going to be a ceremony there. 65 years later, there's going to be a ceremony there. I suppose I should feel good about that. I don't. Who is your audience? Um, if the question is who's going to buy the book, who should buy the book, um, and why? The the very early reviews said that this is an essential addition to the library of Holocaust books because there's nothing like it. Um, so, if the story of the Holocaust is going to continue to be told. And the deniers are going to continue to be out there, but they really don't. I mean, I, I, I pity them more than anything else. Um, but if the story of the Holocaust is going to be taught, um, th the audience for the book should be the people who are, who are taking that class. If they're teaching the Holocaust in high school, this is another way to make the Holocaust an American story and not just something that happened you know, to, uh, to Europeans. Um, the fact that, you know, parents and grandparents of, of Americans went, went through this is a story that needs to be told. And, you know, frankly, I'd like to see the book stay in, in, in libraries for years and years and years. Um, one thing about libraries, and I'll come back to the digital collection, um, when I began researching the book, I, I went on uh, Amazon and began looking for some, some titles, and I would find used copies, and I'd get a used copy, and I'd buy it, and the used copy would come, and it's a library discard, which means a book that came out with these stories in 1963, 64, 65, has been pulled off the shelves, which means it's no longer accessible, okay? So even, even though some parts of the Holocaust story may have been written, if they're gone from the shelves, there's room for, for new material. Um, I, I'm extremely grateful for your response to, to say, you know, what are you doing with the audio? What are you doing with the transcripts? Because, I, I mean, I assume that means this sort of lives on forever or until we blow up the world, you know. And, and otherwise, it would be, you know, a, a CD that I handed to my children and said, uh, yeah, this is what I did in, you know, 2008 and 9 and 10. Michael, you said something about, um, you know, the impact that that being a liberator has had on, uh, on the soldiers, the nurses that, mm -hmm. that were in the camps. What sorts of, not sort of, not what did you see? Mm -hmm. There are photos on, mm -hmm. of what people saw. What was the impact? What did these liberators tell you about how that time in their lives have stayed with them? They can't get the smell out of their out of their system. I mean, olfactory memory is something else. 
it gets triggered a lot. Um, but they'll never forget the stench. Um, they, they're still impacted. I mean, they, many of them show you know, absolute symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, night sweats, flashbacks. 90-year-old guy having a flashback. What's wrong? Why hasn't he gotten help? Why hasn't help been made available? Um, they just they just can't get it out of their system, and and because what they have in their system was not just war, which is bad enough. I mean, I, I've been in war. I was in Vietnam, and and there are memories that I have that that won't go away. But nothing like the guys in World War II have. Um, the the lesson. The ultimate lesson is that we got to think carefully before we send people off to war, because it doesn't end when they come home. The VA, you have people here in you know Bay Pines and in in Tampa will know it more than anybody else. Is overwhelmed by the guys coming back with mental and emotional problems, and these are the guys who are showing symptoms now when they come back. What's going to happen when the symptoms show up when they retire? You know, they get out of the army, they get a job, they work for 30, 35 years, and then they retire, and that burden is lifted from them. And suddenly, just like with the World War II guys who began experiencing PTSD when they retired, you know, all this stuff comes flooding back. Are, are we going to be, are we going to be around to have the facilities to help them, to, you know, to, to help them and help them not screw up their families if they haven't screwed up their families already? Or are we basically going to say, oh, well, we're on to another war? That's, that's, that's something that I deal with at, at the very end of the book. Um, the other thing, the other, one other lesson for people reading the book and for anybody else out there is if you know somebody who's been in a war, ask them about it. And if they say they don't want to talk about it, ask them again next week or next month. Um, they need to know that it's safe to talk about it and that the person asking really wants to hear it. You're not just asking, like, you know, how's the weather? How was the drive up here? You really want to hear it and give them an opportunity to talk about it so they're not holding it all inside them. Um, that's why some of the interviews in the Civil History Project go on for a long, long time. I didn't need an hour and a half with some of these people just to get the stuff with the book. But you push a button, and it's really not fair to say, oh, no, 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 I don't want to hear about that. I mean, I started with a lot of these people in high school and talking with them. How'd you get in the Army? Tell me about it. What'd you do? You know, And they'll take me through all the combat, all the way up, you know, through the, through, you know, I don't believe I talked with anybody who was in the D-Day invasion, but after the D-Day invasion, the fighting at the Battle of the Bulge, and talk about what all that meant, how that affected them. And then we get around to talking about what they experienced with the camps. And then we talk about, you know, their fear that they were on schedule to go to the Pacific to fight and to invade Japan had not the bomb been dropped. Uh, and and, and it's, it's, like, it's like a balloon, man. You stick a pin in it and all the air comes out. And, and if you know guys who were in World War II, who were in Korea, who were in Vietnam, who were in Kosovo, who were in the Gulf War, who were in Iraq or Afghanistan, and they came back, and you haven't asked them about it and made it clear you want to know about it, you got a problem. you, you got to do that.